I, I think the real take home we want to get across is that we are very interested in working with you if you are interested in working with the code base or the documentation, right, or helping moderate issues many, many different ways. So please do um, think about getting in contact um, with us. We're always on the chat, etc. And um, we'll try to go from there. So our next session tails nicely into this. And um, it, there's essentially a couple of different parts. Um, we're going to, we want to sort of highlight that in the species file group, we've started to build out an ecosystem of independent libraries or wrappers, not just for use in taxon works, but perhaps of use to many different communities. So um, Jeff, I think you're going to start off with saying a little bit, uh, Jeff has done an, an incredible, nice amount of work in wrapping a bunch of commonly used APIs that we learned about um, into native language uh, wrappers, so to speak, code libraries that now you can go and use to do your own sort of work. So Jeff, do you want to take it away? Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, so we kind of like nicely covered the uh, what's an API in the previous section, but just to review a little bit, um, it's basically rules and protocols that enable accessing data or functions in an application programmatically from another software environment. Um, and this allows building integrations between biodiversity informatics infrastructures. So some example use cases would be like when iNaturalist wanted to use taxonomy from TaxonWorks projects, they were able to use the API and pull that data into iNaturalist to be able to use the TaxonWorks taxonomy instead of uh, naturalist taxonomy. Um, if you wanted to get a list of new species from Catalog of Life to add into your TaxonWorks project, since Plasi is in Checklist Bank, you'd be able to potentially, we'd be able to potentially develop a task that would allow you to do that. Um, if you wanted to get a link to an original species description in BHL using the BHL names project, we could potentially integrate that. Um, then also the taxon pages are using the taxon works API to publish the data. Um, and then another example would be if you want to pull your data into R for analysis, you can use the um, R taxon works um, wrapper that I've been developing, which I'm going to demo shortly. Um, so for these wrappers that I've been developing, the architecture is inspired by um, Scott Chamberlain's projects, and he's the co-founder of um, our open science. Um, so usually each API wrapper includes a standalone API wrapper usable by any projects. Um, and then a council sandbox, which kind of lets you play around with the wrapper to see how it works and experiment, kind of like the taxon work sandboxes. Um, and then documentation with usage examples, unit tests, and then nice fruit or vegetable based gem names. Um, so I did present on these last taxon works together. Um, so these projects are available. So we've got Bionomia wrapped, um, the Biodiversity Enhanced Location Services, um, Catalog of Life and Checklist Bank as for Epi, um, and iNaturalist as Nasturtium. And then also there's a, a wrapper for Bok Choi, um, which is wrapping the BHL names project. That one's not released quite yet, but will be soon. Um, and that would allow you to basically get the original species description page um, in Biodiversity Heritage Library. Um, I also did a Python wrapper for Bionomia and GN Parser. Um, and then also I've been working in the last several weeks on developing a, a TaxonWorks wrapper, our TaxonWorks. Um, and I'll do a brief demo of that. Um, hopefully everyone can see plot-wise. Let me know if it's too small. So first I'm just going to enter the R environment. Um, and then we need to load the R TaxonWorks package which provides a bunch of functions for using the TaxonWorks API. Um, and if you want to see what functions are available, you can do LSR TaxonWorks, which is going to list all of the, oops. Um, OK, I made a slight mistake with not using the right quote mark to close. OK, so these are the functions that are available in the um, TaxonWorks R package. 
And I've wrapped almost all of the points at this point. Um, there's probably some still that I have left. Um, if you wanted to look at documentation in R, you can always do the question mark um, followed by the function name. So just to look at the next on names documentation, uh, you can basically look through here and see all the parameters that it takes. And then down below, there's uh, basically definitions of those parameters. And then you can also call the examples function see how to use the function. Oops, example, I think, singular. Um, I do need to basically still expand these with more um, examples, but basically forthcoming, I will try to add more example use cases. But like if you want to do a search for um, this species in the Thaxon Works API, you can call it like this. Um, that basically goes out and uh, makes the API call. Right now I am displaying the URL so that you can basically go look at um, the API call, make sure that it's correct, because if this is still kind of in beta testing, uh, I might eventually suppress this, but if you basically click this link, you can go out and look at what the API call was. Um, and this is the uh, JSON data exchange format, um, which is used to exchange data between platforms. Um, so when you call this, you get back uh, metadata, which is basically the uh, pagination. Um, so in this case, you'd be able to use this to programmatically loop through each of the result pages um, to access all of the information if you have multiple pages of data. We are also trying to make sure that all the endpoints provide CSV, because then you won't have to deal with pagination and it will basically just go download the full CSV of data and then you'll be able to use it like a normal data frame in um, R. So beyond the metadata, there's also data, um, which is the data payload. Um, so if you wanted to access the names, you do um, first of all dollar sign data to access the data section and then dollar sign name to access the first name. Um, and if you are not calling just one name, uh, you would basically get back a list that you can access the different names with the indexes, basically like that. Um, so anyway, that's just a quick demo of uh, the R wrapper. I'm probably, oh, I've got like 40 seconds left. Okay, but I'm gonna pass on to uh, the next person in this section. Thanks, Jeff. That's really great. I'm I'm really loving to see this because one of our philosophies was to make that API accessible early. So, ten years ago when we started with Taxon Works, we we started coding it, but we coded the API. So people have been talking about sharing data, making it fair, making it discoverable. Your data already ten years ago were shareable, discoverable, and fair via that API. And really it's tools like these wrappers that are gonna make that um, even more accessible. So thinking about using the R wrapper inside a Jupyter notebook, for example, um, your data are inherently shareable, fairable, fair, um, findable, when you do a little bit of research on what the API is and how to use it. And these tools are all gonna sort of grease the wheel, so to speak. So thanks very much, Jeff, for your effort there. And Jeff posted, Debbie posted tons of links to all the effort. We'd love to have you contribute to those code bases. Um, there's lots of um, interfaces to do that. Yeah, let us know if you use R and this looks like of use. So our next little chat is gonna be Dima. He's gonna show us some really cool uh, API integration that also uses just the same sort of idea where there's a library and um, how we can integrate the APIs right into OpenRefine, which is known and loved by a fair number of us here. Dima. Uh, I, I was thinking uh, we did have an OpenRefine demonstration last time. So I was thinking maybe uh, we can 
like discuss a little bit uh, what uh, what makes um, something accessible. Uh, sure. Like uh, we have we have uh, um, like two main approaches, I think, in uh, uh, in programming. Uh, it is a sort of monolithic approach and a modular approach. And uh, both are valid uh, in different cases. For example, I would argue that Taxon Works is monolithic, uh, but as well as Blender. And uh, I would say that both projects are very successful. Um, and uh, uh, but uh, there is also a philosophy of uh, making uh, small projects, uh, and I think. The way I'm thinking about it is that when I have my own uh, selfish uh, task, like, uh, for example, uh, people pay me salary because they want something. And when I make this something, I see, ah, this part is actually uh, useful by its own. And instead of, uh, you know, trying to make uh, the project uh, as fast as possible, I would extract uh, that particular code and uh, use it um, as its own uh, thing. Uh, like for example, in global names, we did need a parser uh, and uh, it would be easier to incorporate parser inside of verification. Uh, but I think it made sense to make it separate. And uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, like, if you look at <laughs> global names, uh project it's uh like probably 300 different repositories <laughs> because of that um not all of them are useful for everybody but some of them uh, uh have a common uh use some of them are separate just because uh like i try to keep internally the same idea that uh, a project is made from many different modules and uh, uh, I think this approach uh, also allows, uh, uh, like for example, to use it uh, like with Open Refine and things like that. And uh, like when Tommy was given yesterday's uh, lecture, um, I remembered how Nikki actually uh, uh, wrote, um, I think a year ago or two years ago and said, hey Dima, why name finder doesn't work uh, with uh, uh, get, uh, API, uh, like people want to use it in open refine to parse labels. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, I thought, well, Tom, you should use open refine to parse labels for scientific names. Um, so, uh, and uh, I think that like from the point of uh, project, uh, it's helpful to make project um, available for different people. For example, some people use command line interface and find it very powerful, uh, like uh, Bob Misibov, uh, like Jonathan Rees, for example. Um, and uh, some people never use uh, command line interface, but uh, for these people, maybe uh, 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 web interface is more uh, uh, more useful and for programmers of course APIs and for uh, programmers that work locally uh, a project can be used as a library as well without going anywhere outside just working inside of the uh, someone's computer uh, and I think it's good to also to, like to think different ways how to separate project like how to make different inroads into the project. Uh, because the hard part is project itself and uh, adding different usability uh, uh, features um, is relatively easy and uh, you know gives people the option how to use something. Um, that's, I think, what I would like to say. Thanks, Dima. It reminds me very much of how we started the day and talking about the TaxonWorks code base as, as a, a monolith, but also emphasizing that we, we are really trying to, um, when we think about adding new features, and you'll hear about it a little bit later on today in our um, what's next session. When we think about that, um, we're, we're really trying to 
do exactly what you're saying. So we have several libraries that have come out of TaxonWorks that we've built explicitly. And like you said, uh, we've, we've kept them separate. If we would have built them directly in TaxonWorks, it would have been faster, right? It would have been easier to do. But now we've got them extracted, the potential for reuse and integration in various different places happen. So we have four or five examples. There's the GBifference tool, uh, the wonderful radial menus that Jose uh, built that are available all throughout the TaxonWorks are available as a separate JavaScript library. So you too can have radial menus and pop-ups. That's a separate library. Uh, the image processing library for staged images is isolated. We have a gem called Taxonify that does some nomenclatural logic that's isolated. Your biodiversity gem, right, we still use as a separate library. That just made it easy to get, you know, global names functionality into TaxonWorks because we have these separate libraries. So I think especially if you're involved in a project where you know that new code is going to be written or you're involved in a project where uh, you know new functionality is going to happen if you can ask your developers or get them to think about hey what what kind of parts of this project could we isolate so that others might be able to use it and make those kind of commitments then we have a fighting chance of for example sharing code between other content management systems right um, and and uh, you know, one a, a great example of that along is that in some of the work that that, um, that Tom is doing again. I'll bring his name up again. Uh, uh, the, the, with this new Nexus importer, was built on a separate library that I kept separately called Nexus Parser. We added you know unit tests to that, and that code hasn't been touched for ten years. But because it was done as an isolated library with its own tests. It took us, you know, a half a day to update that code so that it could be reused in TaxonWorks as a separate library. And it's sitting there waiting to be um, reused over the long term of software development. So I like that uh, very much, this idea of, of thinking about when we can try to split things out. Uh, Jim, um, I don't want to put Tom, I don't want to make Tom uncomfortable at all. He's lurking in the chat here, or Tom is lurking in the chat here. Uh, but I, I think we'll have it in a couple months, a month or two, Jim. The code already looks great. We're in the tuning process. The kind of questions that Tom is asking about that uh, process and what I see in the code base, it's very mature already. So I'm, I'm hoping in a month or two we'll be able to get that live, if not sooner in the sandboxes. Okay. Uh, we do have a couple more minutes till break. I think we have four minutes. Other questions, what did we gloss over? We sort of went on a couple of different tangents at a couple of different levels of depth. What else could we quickly address um, with respect to species file group technical projects? Um, if anybody has used, Nikki Nicholson says, if anybody has used data set, there's an interesting interview with the maintainer about how he has architected the project to aggressive open source using a plugin architecture so that it's not overwhelmed with pull requests. Thank you, Nikki, for sharing that. This is a really wonderful thing that I was hoping, uh, you know, sort of tangent or slice that I was hoping to sort of get at because there's a lot of metadata, there's a lot of meta about maintaining a code base over time. For example, in Rails, there's something called engines, and we could be splitting out all of the core components of the many different things that Rails does into engines. And this really becomes a, a balance exactly like Dima mentioned. How do we balance the abstractions, the level of abstractions that we could use to make things reusable versus um, the ability to get things done quickly and integrate them and creating environments where we can quickly iterate on certain tools. So I think that's a really open-ended question and topic that um, I would love to hear more feedback on with respect to what should we do in the TaxonWorks code base in the long run? Um, how do we make it more plug and play? How do we get it to be more like Blender at some level? It's a great- Two minutes left. A great uh, observation and, and tangent I was I would love to get into in depth at some point. I will say 
one little thing while people are thinking that that I do think that, I, and again, I'm not sure if monolith is the best word. It it went. It's really interesting about to hear how monolith was sort of, you know, poo pooed or or you know said this is not the best way to do it, and we're going to go all microservices and break it down into like the smallest possible atoms. But there's actually a resurgence if you follow, um, if you follow sort of the the hip conversations in, in Silicon Valley and stuff, there's actually a, a, a fair bit of resurgence towards uh, talking about the role of monoflis in, in uh, maintaining sort of long-term healthy code bases that have come up. And, and with respect to biodiversity informatics, I actually think there's a pretty important role for them. Uh, when we want to make complex statements and we want to describe taxa, we need to describe a lot of different things. That means a lot of different models and a lot of different um, integration among those models and semantics. And that becomes exceedingly difficult to, to compose facts and statements when you're very, very atomized. And so there's some real benefits in my mind into having um, everything in one place, uh, everything that a taxonomist might need or a, a data curation expert might need, uh, sorry, a digitizer might need or a, a collection manager might need. That's a longer talk we could have as well. Our next session is a 20 minute session conversation with Elspeth on uh, thinking about a taxonomy course and some of the technologies that you've heard about here. So thanks everyone for this morning. And then we bounced around a little bit. There's lots of resources out there. We're happy to follow up. And thanks for being with us this morning. And we've got lots of good stuff coming up after the break as well.